So I'm guessing you can click on this video to learn about video games. Either that, or you're just really bored. Either way, this video will cover the entire history of video games, from the very first to the latest. And I know that nearly 20 minutes long is a long time, but the reason it's so long is because I wanted to make a video that covers most of everything. If you have more in-depth looks at certain video games and their history, then you can subscribe to my channel because that's pretty much what I'll be doing from now on. Okay, let's start. In 1952, practically the very first video game ever was made. No, this game was a Pong or even Tennis for Two. This was OXO. We confirmed! It was written on the EDSCA, or the Electronic Display Storage Automatic Calculator. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. This calculator was really big. It was, it was also one of the first computers that could digitally store programs on it, which is fitting for the very first video game. Some similar games at the time were Nimrod and Brody the Brain, though it's up for grabs on which is truly the first video game. Another incredibly early video game I'd like to talk about is Space War. On the PDP-1, it was developed by Steve Russell in 1962 at MIT. In it, two ships fly around a star in battle, but they are affected by the star's gravity and hitting the star destroys the ship. Space War was spread across the other PDP-1 computers and became the very first video game ever to be played on different computer installations. Throughout the rest of the 1960s, a few more computer games were created, and this combined with the falling costs for computers means that a lot more of these games were being commercially sold, but in the 1970s is when the true video game market launched, 1971 to be exact. In 1971, pretty much the very first arcade game ever released. It was titled Galaxy Game, and it was just an exact copy of Space Wars. Also, the Magnavox Odyssey was released this year. It was the very first video game home console and it featured black and white graphics, little overlays, as well as the game Table Tennis. I made a video covering the early history of video game consoles as well, if you want to learn more. But things really took off in 1972 with the release of Pong. Pong was a training exercise by Alan Alcorp at Atari. It was a direct ripoff of the Magnavox's Odyssey's table tennis game. But nevertheless, Pong became the first commercially successful video game and also one of the most copied games of all time. Pong ripoffs seemed to be the most common type of game at this point, but eventually more games started to appear, games like Speed Racer or Racer in the US, which had scrolling graphics in the steering wheel, and Gunfight, which was the very first arcade game to use a microprocessor, and also the first to depict human-to-human -human fighting, which, as we all know, led to the downfall of humanity. Throughout the late 70s and mid 80s, arcade games had a golden age. This is when Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and Joust came out. This was a big time for video games, and many icons made their debut, and many advancements made hardware too. Games quickly came into color, and vector technology is developed and subsequently shoved down the trash. Also notable, the first Laserdisc game, Astron Belt, Dragon Layer, which used cell animated video, and the very first 16-bit video game ever, Pole Position. Earlier, I mentioned the Magnavox Odyssey being a home console. It was the first of many consoles, most of which didn't do too well. But Nintendo made their very first appearance with Color TV, the best-selling home console of the first generation. But it would be before the second gen before things really began to pick up. 1977, the Atari 2600 came out and revolutionized the home console market forever. It did a mediocre in its first few years, but in 1978, Space Invaders came out, and the 2600 began selling like crazy. This home market created many big publishers and developers still around today, like Activision and Mattel. The, the Atari 2600 may have started with tiny 2 kilobyte games, by the end of its life, games like Pitfall 2 1984 were using 4 times the amount of RAM of those original games. Some computers also came out during this point in time. The Intellivision was created by Mattel Electronics in 1979, and was designed to have rich graphics and more complex and replayable gameplay than the 2600. It was much more powerful than the 2600 and a great console for its time, which would soon be coming to an end. Transition. Here's an easy question for you. Which of these games is the closest thing to the real thing? A. In television Major League Baseball. B. Atari Baseball. The video game market crash of 1983, otherwise known as the Atari Shock, was a huge falling out in the video game market. Nearly 97% of all revenue dropped in this two-year period. 
Most people seem to attribute the crash to a single game, E.T. This isn't really true, but some truth can be pulled from this. As mentioned earlier, the Atari 2600 was out at this time, it was doing extremely well due to a game called Space Invaders. Many other consoles came trying to get some of that sweet, sweet money, and with more consoles came more games. Plenty of these games are copies and cash grabs, and this combine, with the huge overproduction of this game, meant that stores were soon flooded with less than stellar games. Another key factor in the recession was competition between different home computers and consoles. Now, there is a lot to say about this competition which I might cover in another video, but the most notable bit of competition was between Commodore and Texas Instruments. They both made PCs, and they both dropped their prices to one-up each other and attack the competition ruthlessly. Some critics describe this as self-destruction. All these problems came to fruition in 1983, when the release of overproduced bad games, namely Pac-Man for 2600 and yes, E.T. flooded the market. Stores dropped the prices of games from around $35, which is $95 a day, to a measly $5, 13 a day. Almost instantly, companies like Magnavox abandoned the market. While other smaller companies were affected by the crash, possibly the company with the most damage to it was Atari itself. As mentioned earlier, Atari made a pretty bad port of Pac-Man to the 2600 in a really rushed E.T. game. Both of these were huge commercial failures. Though Pac-Man made a lot of money, it was heavily overproduced. Funny enough, this trailer probably had more effort put into it than the video game. Things got so bad for Atari that they buried hundreds of thousands of unsold stock in a landfill in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Finally, around 1,500 arcades closed their doors during these two years. Things were looking pretty bad for the industry, but there was some hope. Now, one of the main problems of the Atari 2600 and other second-gen consoles was that third-party games were not very closely monitored. This helped create a large amounts of crappy games that oversaturated the market. But a little company named Nintendo, with a new third-gen console called the Famicom or the NES, only approved games that reached their quality standard. On the same day, July 15, 1983, the Famicom and the Sega SG-1000 were released. The US market was in shambles after the recession, but Nintendo had an idea. Instead of marketing the new consoles a video game, they marketed it as a toy, at least in the states and Europe. And so the NES was created, and with it the raw robot to make it look more like a toy. The video game system that comes with a friend to play with, the NES is the cure for loneliness confirmed. It had a huge amount of success in Europe and quite a bit of success in the US. Slowly but surely the gaming market began to be rebuilt and Nintendo was spearheading it with the NES. After failing to gain traction with the SG-1000, Sega turned around and released the Master System or Mark III. Now, the Sega and Nintendo were real competitors, and each side had different strategies and marketing techniques. While Sega focused on innovative technology and unique gameplay, Nintendo focused on making a memorable game series of games like Mario, Link, and Metroid. While Sega might have dominated some regions like Europe and Brazil, overall the NES heavily outsold the Master Systems, with over 61 million copies worldwide, compared to the Master Systems 14.8 million. Some series still around today made their first appearances, like Final Fantasy and Metal Gear. Big publishers and companies like EA and LucasArts also started making primarily console games. In Japan 1987, the TurboGrafx-16 was released as the first 4th gen console and the first 16-bit system overall. While it did pretty well in Japan, more importantly it signaled the rise of 16-bit consoles. The TurboGrafx success would be nothing compared to the new released SNES in 1990 and the Genesis in 1988. The SNES was released by Nintendo because the NES stopped making money. The Genesis' marketing was built around Sega's new mascot, Sonic, in a made-up term, Blast Processing, which I said made the Genesis more powerful than the SNES. Sega marketed it itself as cooler than Nintendo, and also had the catchphrase, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. During this gen, some improvements to hardware were larger sprites, stereo audio, basic 3D, and more colorful screens. There was also a large controversy in the media at this time over a game named Mortal Kombat. You may have heard of it, it was very gory and violent, and the media didn't like that one bit. When the game was ported to home consoles, the SNES opted for no gore. But the Genesis went for a secret code that people could enter to that would enable the gore. Because of this, the Genesis and Mortal Kombat outsold the SNES 1 to 3. But pretty soon, there was a Supreme Court case, blah blah blah, and the SRB rating was made. Yippee. Finally, handhelds. Nintendo released the Game Boy, which is a monotrone handheld able to play game cartridges that had over 35 hours of battery life. 
There were over 1,000 games for the GameCube, including the first Pokemon Red and Blue games. Other handhelds didn't fare too well, even though some of them had 16-bit graphics. The Game Boy just had a much better battery and game library. Though there was some very basic 3D in the 4th gen, the 5th gen is where 3D games started to really take off. The consoles released here were the original PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and the Sega Saturn. Most of these consoles were either 32 or 64-bit and played mostly 3D games. Another big change in consoles at this time was the introduction of the DVD. Though there were a few earlier 5th gen consoles, the first big one was 3DO Interact and Multiplayer. It had a huge amount of hype behind it, and then didn't sell too well because it cost over $700 at the time. Next came the Atari Jaguar in 1993, which had a very small game library and only sold over 250,000 units. Next came the 32-bit Sega Saturn in 1994, which sold well in Japan but ended up only selling up to third place overall. Finally, a pretty good one, the PlayStation came out in 1994, it had a heavy focus on third-party developers and a more mature marketing campaign. It was the first console ever to sell 100 million units worldwide, and also the Nintendo 64 came out in 1996. That was successful, developing for it was a hassle thanks to the expensive cartridge format. Though the 64 stayed strong thanks to first party titles, it was still a distant second to the PlayStation. At this point in time, PC gaming was beginning to have a resurgence with dropping prices of owning one, hardware getting cheaper and more powerful, and games like Doom were being sold in a shareware model, in which people basically got a floppy disk trial of the game before buying the entire game. Also, mobile games first appear with Snake on the Nokia. It was also around this time that mods began to become more popular with games like Half-Life 2 getting heavily modded. Some games even began to support mods. The very first 6th gen console was a Sega Dreamcast, and while it did pretty well at first, it was pretty much destroyed by a little console named the PS2. The PS2 was able to play DVD style discs and DVDs and CDs as well. The PS2 did extremely well and solidified Sony in the console market for years to come. Soon after the success of the PS2 came the GameCube from Nintendo. It was Nintendo's first disc using console and it did okay. Though the GameCube had some solid first party games and a few third party, it suffered from the disc being little tiny and not being able to hold as much game as the competition. It also was viewed as a kid's console, which... That's no good! By the end of 2001, Microsoft released Xbox as their first console. The Xbox was modeled after Microsoft computers which made porting PC games easier. The Xbox was actually sold at a significant loss and was supposed to make the money back with game sales. Halo was released on the Xbox and became the central focus and reason to get an Xbox. The PS2 sold over 152 million units compared to the 24 million of the Xbox and the 22 million of the GameCube. While Nintendo wasn't doing too well in their mainline console market, it still dominated the handhelds of the Game Boy Advance released in 2001, selling over 81 million units. One interesting thing about this generation was the return of weird controllers like the ones in arcade cabinets, things like DDR mats, DK bongos, and the Guitar Hero controllers. While these controllers might have been weird, they weren't nearly as successful as what comes next. The seventh generation of consoles was approaching. First away is the Xbox 360 in 2005, which could play games rendered natively in HD. In 2006, the PlayStation 3 then came out, and finally the Wii was released the same year as the PS3, which had a special sort of controller that had motion sensors built in. The Wii wasn't that powerful, it couldn't even play in HD, but it was cheap and had a huge amount of games on it. It did extremely well in the growing casual market thanks to games like Wii Sports and Wii Fit. But not you, Wii Play. Not you. No. The Wii became the fastest selling console of this generation and ended up selling over 100 million units worldwide. Seeing the success of the Wii, both Sony and Microsoft attempted to copy the motion controls. Kinect was sort of a success, I mean it sold a lot of units, which is probably because it was bundled with the 360 most of the time, but it was pretty bad. The PlayStation Move was just, uh, no. Also at this time, Nintendo released a DS and Sony made the PlayStation Portable, or PSP. The PSP was stronger, but the DS was unique, and it had some strong games for both the casual and normal market. Mobile games began to rise, with games like Angry Birds and Candy Crush, and finally the Ouya came out a crowdfunded console that made $8.5 million in pre-orders. It was mediocre, I guess. The Wii U was the very first 8th gen console. It was a Wii with an extra screen. Yeah, it was bad. 
The Wii U had some HD and some backwards compatibility with Wii games. The naming of it may have confused some people and made them think it was just the gamepad was just an add-on for the Wii. Next, in 2013, the PlayStation 4 was released. The PS4 was designed on an architecture and made it very similar to the developer for the PC, which meant more cross-platform games. The Xbox One also came out for the year and it exists. The Wii U was a universal failure, haha. Ha. The PS2 also did well thanks to a large amount of exclusives and the easiness to develop for, propelled Sony back to the front of the console game. Meanwhile, the Xbox One existed. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad console, it just didn't do too much. Finally, the Nintendo Switch was released in 2017. The Switch might have borrowed some concepts from the Wii U, but it did them much better this time around. Also, Sony and Microsoft released newer and more powerful smaller consoles. So that's everything. Or is it? Recently, I came across a device. A very mysterious device. Very mysterious. Mysterious. Real. Mysterious. Anyway, this device can see into the future, and I'm going to look into the future with it. But to be honest, there's been enough talk about video games. So instead, let's peer into the future of me. But I have a YouTube channel. Original content. Huh.